Good morning, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Um, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for, uh, to the organizers for giving the, me the opportunity to speak. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to provide a bit of background, um, what to consider when we're thinking about modern contraceptive options for women on ART, uh, new developments in contraception and some key messages. So one of the um, UN um, goals for sustainable development uh, focuses on reproductive and sexual health. So by 2030, ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services um, everywhere. But why and why is that important? So access to family planning and reproductive health services can, um, for, for women, provide birth spacing, so planning pregnancies, um, which not only has lots of physical benefits, but psychological benefits. Uh, it reduces unwanted pregnancies, which in turn prevent unsafe abortions. And just a little bit more about that. Um, globally, six out of 10 pregnancies are unwanted, uh, sorry, six out of 10 unwanted pregnancies end in induced abortion. Um, 97% of unsafe abortions take place in lower middle income settings uh, and 75% of induced abortions in sub-Saharan Africa are deemed unsafe and 50% are deemed the least safe, which means they're um, undertaken by an untrained person using dangerous or invasive methods. This has a huge impact um, on physical and mental morbidity of those affected um, and in terms of mortality contributes to uh, 185 deaths per 100,000 abortions in sub-Saharan Africa, which translates to 15,000 preventable deaths each year just due to unsafe abortions. Aside from that, um, being able to plan pregnancies and having access to family planning improves maternal health and can reduce infant mortality. And that can be particularly important for women living with HIV if they're not yet established on treatment or they're undiagnosed. Um, being not on treatment or not established on treatment has worse health outcomes. Some methods of contraception can also protect against STIs. Um, and aside from the health benefits, having universal access can um, expand education opportunities, leads to female empowerment, um, leads to poverty reduction, and can contribute to sustainable population growth and economic development. So talking a little bit about what modern contraceptive options there are. So it's said that the ideal contraceptive should meet the following criteria. It should be widely acceptable, uh, affordable, easy to use, safe, highly effective, and there should be minimal requirement for motivation to keep maintaining it and um, minimal supervision to use it. Now, as far as I know, there is no such contraception at the moment. There is no ideal contraceptive, um, but there are lots of options. Um, so the various options available for modern contraceptives, so that's anything aside from um, basically using calendar methods, planned, planned intercourse or withdrawal, um, can be split into several different groups. At the bottom, we have the male options, which are condom and male sterilization. Um, but female options, we can divide them into hormonal and non-hormonal methods. And then there's user-dependent and user-independent. So user-dependent means it relies on that person taking it regularly uh, or using it regularly, whereas the user-independent methods are more long-acting and uh, re re uh, have less um, need to, for them to be kind of remembered. Um, so examples of that, for example, are the implant, the uh, copper IUD, the hormonal IUD, um, also referred to as the IUS, uh, and the injection. Um, and then user-dependent methods are pills, rings, uh, and patches, which I don't believe are widely available in sub-Saharan Africa. So what do we know about uptake and use um, in sub-Saharan Africa? So an analysis of the demographic and health surveys looked at coverage um, and found that overall coverage is about 22% for access to modern contraceptive options. Um, but that has a huge range um, from as low as 3.5% in the Central African Republic to just under 50% in Namibia. And the preferred options are injection, male condom, and implant in that particular order. Um, but that may just reflect the fact that those are the most easily available and also the least expensive options in most settings. 
Uh, lack of contraception uptick is um, associated with poverty, not having had formal education, lack of knowledge about what options are available, um, lack of knowledge about family, family planning services, not having had children before and living in rural areas. And just a um, uh, touch on adolescence specifically, we've just come from our session on adolescence this morning. Um, the age of consent varies a little bit, but in a lot of sub-Saharan Africa is either 16 or 18. And the ability to receive contraception for those who are under that age of consent varies. So in South Africa, for example, there is law to say that those who are 12 and older um, could potentially access contraceptives without parental um, consent. Um, however, uh, in Kenya, that's officially illegal. It's illegal to provide family planning methods to those under 18 um, unless a parent has consented to this. In practice, that isn't necessarily the case, but it may vary quite a lot, and it'd be interesting to hear what your experiences are with that. Then, specifically for women living with HIV, um, a systematic review showed that there's a number of different factors that influence their, their preferences. Um, so affordability, they're already spending money traveling to their HIV clinic, taking time off work to do that. So, uh, you know, modern contraception in addition to that should be affordable. Uh, thoughts around perceived effectiveness. So there might be thoughts around hormonal contraception uh, causing infertility um, and things like um, male condoms not being particularly effective. Um, concerns around side effects as well. Um, for example, impotence from male sterilization or, um, you know, kind of experiences from previous methods that did cause significant side effects. Um, dual protection from STIs and pregnancy, partnership considerations as well. So, um, for example, where the male partner was very dismissive of the use of contraceptive options or didn't want the, the woman to use a modern contraceptive, they were more likely to stop using it. Uh, there was also concern around potential um, unintended disclosure. If they were asking to use condoms, they thought maybe the male partner might um, start thinking things. Um, and also healthcare provider recommendations. So the healthcare providers in the room, you do have an influence on what they choose. They can, you know, some were told certain methods would not be effective for them or they shouldn't use them, they were not right for them and they occasionally felt unsupported in their choices. Um, but convenience really was the really big thing that differentiated um, the findings in women living with HIV compared to those who weren't. Um, <clears throat> and. The things that influenced that were they wanted ideally methods that required fewer clinic visits. As I said, they're already spending a lot of time traveling. Non-daily methods, they're already taking a daily medication for their HIV. They don't really want to be taking something else on top of that. Um, and there was also some preference expressed around receiving the contraception through the HIV care facility, so it's part of integrated HIV and reproductive health care. Saying all of that, there is no one-size-fits-all, and we can look at numbers, but with contraception it's still about the individual uh, and what works for them. So when we're thinking about what would work for an individual, um, so women living with HIV, the first thing you might think about is drug interactions with their antiretrovirals. And this table can look quite intimidating, um, but a big message is that the dolitegravir column, which is a little bit um, small, so you probably can't read it, but the highlighted column shows interactions between hormonal contraceptives and dolitegravir, and they're all green, so there are no contraindications. However, if you look at the protease inhibitors and the favorins, there are significant potential interactions um, which can reduce efficacy and can increase side effects. Um, so having uh, women on those uh, antiretrovirals where they're needing modern contraceptive options and they don't need to be on that antiretroviral therapy might be a good reason to switch them to dolitegravir if they haven't been already. Other things to consider, um, future fertility plans. So some methods take a little bit longer for fertility to return. Some methods are permanent. Um, previous medical history, there might be some contraindications to certain methods, particularly estrogens breastfeeding plans, previous experiences, what have they tried before, what has worked for them, what hasn't worked for them, what didn't they like, um, and desired effectiveness. And of course you want a method that's very effective, but you may want to, an individual may balance that with, you know, 
having fewer side effects, they'll take something that's maybe a little bit less effective like a condom because they don't want to use hormonal methods, or they might want something extremely effective and they don't mind having some side effects. Any other medications beside their antiretrovirals that they might be taking, whether they would like to be more in control of the treatment, have a user-dependent method like a pill that they can stop if they would like to stop it, or something they don't have to worry about like an IUD or an implant risk of STIs, but importantly, availability and cost. So what for that individual is actually available to them realistically and what will they be able to afford? What might be uh, free at the point of care um, is obviously very important and will vary across settings. And then I just wanted to talk about TDF and the depot injection because they are TDF is part of the most widely used ART regimen and the depot is the most widely used contraceptive option. But um, we've heard a lot about bone density yesterday from Professor Gregson. Um, but both are independently associated with a loss of bone mineral density. And if you use them together, that effect is worsened. Um, <clears throat> how that translates to increased risk of fracture is unclear and we just don't have that information. Um, so until we know more, what the suggestion is, is that that information should be included in contraceptive counseling, particularly in those who are already at risk um, of, uh, of reduced bone mineral density, such as smokers, people using um, glucocorticoids, etc. And that uh, is also for women using PrEP. Just gonna briefly touch on some new developments. Um, so the pre-existing vaginal ring had to be kept in the fridge. You used it for one cycle. It's quite expensive. There's a new ring um, that's been developed that you can reuse for 13 cycles. So you wear it for 21 days, remove it for seven, and it doesn't need to be refrigerated and it's, quite, and it's pretty well effective. There's a new progestogen only pill, um, which is uh, derived from spironolactone, which is different from the other progestogen-only pills developed from testosterone. Um, it's very effective, and the side effect profile is better compared to the desogestrel pill, which is the one that's most widely used, which causes a lot of irregular bleeding. And it's more forgiving because you can take it up to 24 hours late. The Mirena is the, the hormonal IUD, or one of the, the forms of the hormonal IUD, and based on um, recent evidence, the US, Europe, and the UK have approved extended licensing for up to eight years of use when it's used for contraception, um, uh, which may make it a lot more cost-effective because its availability in sub-Saharan Africa is variable, and it's more easily available in the private sector than the public sector at the moment, um, but this could potentially have an important impact uh, on its use. Then some novel approaches. There's a kind of frameless copper non-device, which is very nondescript and is very in very early stages. Um, but the idea behind this is that it will have fewer side effects than the traditional copper coil. Um, they've sort of looked into redesigning the female condom, and we talked about yesterday how you know it's quite noisy. Whether this option is less noisy, I don't know. But it's meant to be easier to insert um, than the previous one. And there's ongoing uh, uh, studies into male contraceptives that are reversible, but you know most of them have been stopped early due to untenable side effects. And whether we'll ever find an option that a male would be happy to use and stay on is up for debate. Um, so just to summarize, so dolitegravir um, should not interact with any hormonal contraceptive and should not be a barrier to accessing choice. Um, options with protease inhibitors and efavirenz do limit the options of hormonal methods, so take that into account. There are lots of different things, although availability will vary. Newer options are being developed uh, and um, you know, an individualized approach for women accessing contraception is really important. Counsel them on this loss of potential, this loss of bone mineral density when they're using TDF and injection together, particularly if they're already at increased risk. And we need to move to, you know, continue to move towards universal access to sexual and reproductive health care. Um, it's so important, but maybe the most important message of all, which we talked about yesterday when it came to PrEP, when it came to ART, is that choice really matters. Thank you very much.